Today is Tuesday, September the 25th, 2012. I'm Matthew TG. I'm Heath Mulligan. And I'm Tony Casey. Welcome to the Technology Show, a weekly podcast featuring technology, theology, and everything in between. This is episode 173. And All right. I'll, yeah, I'll go ahead. Well, I was going to say, so kind of a... a, a sports disaster weekend for me and you <laughs> yes we had some uh and also had some replacement refs in here trying to get the show the studio <laughs> set up so we had some issues this morning sorry about that we're not going to talk about clemson they're going to be back they're going to finish 11 and 1 they're going to have a great season it's going to be phenomenal so you're predicting right now they will beat south carolina the university clemson of will Play the University <laughs> of South Carolina. I was hoping for a bold season. prediction. Yeah, well, the Packers are two and one. Are well, almost one and <laughs> two. All right, all right. Let's let's announce our uh, winner for last week's giveaway. Last week we interviewed Jeremy Summers and Matt Leroy, the authors of Awakening Grace, and the winner of this autographed copy mm. of this book is brrr, Doug Dennis, pastor. In Asheboro, North Carolina, Doug, we'll be getting with you. Get your address, and uh, we expect a six-page book report on a wedding. Listen, and, and, and Doug, we don't want to see this on eBay, okay? We're just that's right. Just saying. I mean, because this thing's <laughs> going for a lot on eBay. So, well, we want to welcome Dr. Lenny Lucetti to the show. He is an associate press, a professor of proclamation and Christian ministries at Wesley Seminary at Indiana Wesleyan University. He's an ordained minister in the Wesleyan Church and has been involved in pastoral ministry for more uh, than 15 years. And he's also the author of Preaching Essentials, which we're going to be giving away a copy of this this week. Uh, Lenny, it's great to have you on the show today. How are you doing? Doing well. Thanks, Keith. Great to be here. Um, as we start, we, we want to talk about preaching effectively and prophetically, but before we start, maybe the best way to start is, what does it mean to preach effectively? Well, that's a, that's a big question. Uh, good question. I, I tend to think of uh, preaching good, uh, I'll do the preacher thing and come up with some alliteration. So, uh, <laughs> preaching that is good and effective, uh, number one, is, is Christian. Uh, and by that I mean uh, it's devotional and theological. Uh, so devotionally, preaching, preaching should be viewed not as merely a rhetorical task, putting together a talk, but it should be viewed as a spiritual discipline through which the preacher connects with Christ through the homiletic process. Mm. Uh, preaching should do wonders for the preacher's soul. Mm. And, and the fact is, when uh, there's so many preachers burning out, I think a part of it is because they they maybe go about preaching as a rhetorical task, not as a spiritual discipline through wow. which they connect with Christ. I actually wrote my dissertation on that uh, very subject. Mm. Uh, the second thing is, uh, when I say that good preaching is Christian, is that it has some theological substance to it. I don't mean that the, the preaching should just be a doctrinal sermon. Uh, please don't preach doctrinally every week. What I do mean, though, is that Every sermon we preach, that's a Christian sermon, that's a good sermon, should say something of substance about God. Mm. Uh, um, it shouldn't just be, you know, five steps to a good marriage, uh, mm. five principles of managing finances uh, that we could apply without any relational connection uh, to God. Mm. You know, and if not, if it, turns, it turns into good advice that could be uh, given to us by uh, Dr. Phil or Oprah. So, so the sermon should say something profound about God and relationship with Him, and yet it should be practical. So, so it's Christian in that it's devotional and theological. I, I think uh, a sermon should also be uh, contextual. Mm. Um, that is, a good sermon, an effective sermon, listens to uh, the literary and historical context of the biblical text, as well as to the contemporary context of the people to whom we preach. Um, and I, so I, I say that the best preachers are the best listeners, not the, the best talkers, because they've, they've listened long and hard to the biblical text and long and hard to the hopes and hurts of their contemporary context. So, so good preaching is Christian, contextual. It's clear as well. Uh, there's focus to it. I think we live in an ADD world, yeah. and lots of, lots of us preachers have ADD. Uh, 
I remember one of the sermons I preached early on, my first year of ministry, uh, was called Six Godly Traits of Joseph, where I tried to unpack 13 chapters of Genesis, Genesis 37 to 50. And an hour <laughs> later, uh, most of the congregation had felt fall, fallen asleep. So uh, I think we preachers, in an attempt to do justice to the text, end up saying way more than we should. And so uh, yeah. these days I think, I think sermons should have... Uh, one intersection between text and context around which the whole sermon revolves. So clarity is so important. And Paul said, you know, pray that I proclaim the gospel clearly as I should. Yeah. And then a good sermon is creative. Uh, that is, once we have some clarity, we have the freedom to be creative and mm. uh, think outside the box about uh, new ways to preach, uh, putting images, concrete images, to uh, the conceptual ideas of the sermon. Um, Lenny, let me let me break in here real quick. I want to go back to contextual. Um, I think for some people, I, early in my ministry, this was a huge hurdle for me. And and to to be quite honest, man, I pastored a year for four or church for fourteen years. I don't think I really began to be contextual in terms of exegeting the culture mm. um, effectively till probably year nine or ten. I, I wonder. Um, you know, in a classroom setting, as you address uh, future pastors, um, what, what do you say about that in terms of how, how does one exegete the culture in which they are ministering? It's a great question, yeah. And, and I deal with this pretty extensively in the book. Lots of the literature and preaching today has to do with uh, exegeting the scriptures well, uh, homiletic creativity, and very little, uh, at least in the last say, 30, 40 years has been written about uh, the contextual analysis you're talking about, Tony. So one of the ways I go about this in the classroom is I tell the uh, uh, students who are, they actually have to preach to the class, and I encourage them to preach to us. So uh, how, does, how does the text that you're preaching intersect with the needs of uh, seminary students in 2012? And actually... Uh, have them sort of think through how the exegesis of the text engages them personally, devotionally. I think that's contextual. Mm -hmm. uh, if they're in a church setting, how does how does the text exegesis of the text intersect with the needs and struggles and dreams of their church, and then their community, the nation, and the world? So I think if if during the homiletic process, preachers after they've done the listening to the text, they listen to the their own soul, the church, the community, nation, and world, I think they'll preach sermons that are contextual. Yeah. Um, let's. One of the things that we talk about, effective preaching, prophetical preaching, uh, unpack the prophetical part of this. So for many of us, um, you know, especially maybe people just starting out in ministry, the vision we have of prophetic preaching is the prophet who's in you know, the Old Testament, and, you know, they're telling what the future is going to be. Uh, talk, talk to us a little bit about prophetic preaching um, just in the everyday life of the Church. Well, I should point out that uh, a lot of people have different opinions about what it means to preach prophetically. So uh, I'll simply give you mine, sure. and, uh, and hopefully it makes some sense. Uh, let me say what preaching pastorally is. I mm. think preaching pastorally is addressing in the sermon the individual soul needs of the people. Uh, so it's more perhaps individualistic, uh, more about how you can grow spiritually, what you can do spiritually, uh, how God can comfort you individually. Prophetic preaching, I think, is larger than that. I think prophetic preaching is um, a sermon designed to shape the community at large. Um, so it's dealing with perhaps broader issues. It's not always forth-telling what's coming as, as much as it is sort of describing, unpacking for a community of faith what it looks like for the community to embody the values mm. of the kingdom, not of this world, uh, the values of Christ. And so um, it's funny, I did, a lot of, I, I did a lot of prophetic preaching 
in my most recent pastorate, before I even knew what prophetic preaching was, I just started to talk about what it would look like. We began to dream together mm. about what our church and our community would look like yeah. if we began to embody the values of Christ and his kingdom as a community, and how that would ripple out into the community. Wow. Almost accidentally. Huh. Huh. Uh, Lenny, I want to talk to you about what sermon prep looks like for a pastor and really if you could unpack we you know most of our listeners are pastors or pastor spouses but for a pastor what does it look like to prep from a yearly standpoint a monthly standpoint a weekly standpoint and a daily standpoint what are some practices that we need to go ahead and start implementing into our lives yeah, let, let me let me start with uh, the daily or, or the weekly rhythm of preaching. Uh, I, I think uh, is that okay if I do sure. that? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I think of the preacher uh, first of all as Theotokos. That is, uh, it's a third century term uh, the church came up with to describe Mary. Theo, God, Tokos, bearer. Uh, Mary is the God bearer, mm. uh, and it wasn't so much a term to us elevate the status of Mary as much as it was to elevate the status of Jesus. That when Mary gave birth to uh, Jesus, she didn't just birth a good man, uh, she birthed God. And in a very similar way, I think that the preacher is Theotokos, that we're called not just to preach good sermons, but to preach uh, sermons that incarnate Christ in the moment the words are spoken so that people can encounter him uh, in that moment. Very good, very mm. good. As if preaching good sermons wasn't hard enough, now we have to yeah. preach good sermons. <laughs> uh, so here's a process. So, so with that goal in mind, here's a process that I think facilitates birthing sermons that birth Christ, in a sense. Uh, you know, Monday, I, I never took, well, I did take Mondays off most of, about half my ministry, and then started to take uh, Fridays off. So, so Monday morning, I would, uh, that would be my conception time. Okay. Uh, uh, the angel said to, to uh, Joseph, that which is conceived in Mary is of the Holy Spirit. Mm. So I try to get pregnant earlier in the week <laughs> <laughs> so that the baby's full term and ready to be delivered on Sunday, right? Yeah. So, uh, so for me, that just involves sitting with the text, the Holy Spirit, and my people in my heart as I go to the text for them on their behalf. Oh, nice. And uh, uh, so I... So one of the things I try to do is avoid commentaries. If I go to commentaries too quickly, that I call that a contraceptive. Yep. Yes. Um, and uh, that might stifle my Holy Spirit conception. Mm. I try also not to let my good homiletical ideas determine my exegetical findings, which to me is an artificial insemination, if I can <laughs> use that term. <laughs> and then also I try, uh, I try not to let the sermon just uh, be about exegesis of the text. Uh, but also exegesis of the context. So, yeah. so, so I don't want the sermon to be a full of literary and historical context without any connection. So I call that uh, a sterile sermon, actually. So, so I really just try to Monday uh, try to get pregnant with a sermon from the text. Tuesday, uh, I call that uh, uh, ultrasound, where I try to get some sense of clarity about how the what will be the one bridge, the one yeah. intersection between the text and the context. What will this sermon on this Sunday mm. say in one sentence? Uh, so I need that ultrasound. Am I having a boy or a girl? Is it big or small? Mm. Uh, and so that, that helps me a ton once I get that, sure. that statement. And then I try to, and then once I get clarity, I try to, that's when the water breaking happens for me on Wednesday, where I just uh, brainstorm for uh, Images, illustrations, stories, current events, pop culture, media, around uh, that that ultrasound, around that focus statement. So Wednesday's my fun day. I think once we get clear on what the sermon will say, we can be real creative about how we'll say it. And that that's fun for me. The creative juices, water breaking, starts flowing. And then on uh, on uh, Thursday, I start. I, I structure the sermon. That's what I call labor. Okay. Uh, it's going to be a traditional uh, delivery labor. Uh, it's going to be a C-section. Am I going to induce uh, water, water birth? 
Uh, in other words, is this going to be a three-point sermon, a linear sermon, a narrative sermon, deductive, inductive? Uh, so I want to get think through the labor of the sermon. And I, I don't think of the sermon as 4,000 words. I think of it as five, six, seven, eight stones that I'm going to step across to get to the other side of the river. Um, and so, so thinking of how I'll move through the sermon from here to there yeah. to there to there. Mm. And then delivery. Uh, uh, delivery is so important, and um, what I want to emphasize here is uh, the importance of spending some time thinking through how we're going to deliver the baby, the sermonic baby. Uh, so often we spend 10 to 15 hours writing the sermon and very little time thinking through and maybe even practicing how we'll deliver it. Mm. When... What's odd is, you know, the sermon is not a written event, but an oral event, and most preachers spend 10 to 15 hours writing it and less than an hour on delivery. Mm. So I encourage preachers to spend less time writing it and more time thinking through prayerfully, yeah. practicing delivery. Yeah. Mm. So I would spend two hours on Saturday, two hours on Sunday, prepping to deliver the baby. It, you know, Lenny, I, I want to jump in here. It's, it's interesting, as I, especially as you talk about the delivery part of this. Um, w- one of the books I just recently read is this one right here. It's it's George Hunter's most recent. Uh, he's you know professor of evangelism at Asbury Seminary, and uh, you know this this book is kind of you know he he kind of goes back to some of his previous works, but. What interests me about this book is so much of this is qualitative research based where they just continue to look at growing congregations. And one of the things that's consistent in all these studies is that where churches are growing, that um, they have tapped into something emotive. Now, again, I want to be clear here, not emotionalism. But the point is this, that we are emotional beings. Um, we're not just intellectual, you know, we're emo- uh, emotional beings. And um, their research over the last 60 years seems to strongly suggest that if we're going to see life change, we are going to tap into something emotive within the listener. And as you're talking about just this whole thing of delivery, I mean, isn't, isn't this part of it? Isn't that part of what happens in terms of the delivery? And, and we're just trying to make this connection? Absolutely, yeah. I, I, one, of, one of the beauties of having that focus statement after you've exegeted the text and the context is you can step back from that one sentence that's going to be the center around which the sermon revolves, and you can ask yourself the question, is this uh, worth a sermon? <laughs> is this compelling enough to yeah. preach? Uh, am I passionate about it? Will this tap the heartbeat of my people? Yeah. And if it's not, then you just say, well, let me just chuck this and come up with something else. But... Uh, it's so important to me, uh, Tony, to be able to uh, preach a sermon with conviction and passion because it's something I've internalized throughout the week, especially preparing to deliver it. And I think, uh, going back to what I said earlier, the best preachers are the best listeners. Uh, mm. We have to listen to the text, yeah. but I think we also need to sit with our people and just simply listen to their hurts and their hopes, their dreams, their mm. disappointments. Uh, one of the challenges uh, that that we have in a growing church uh, is is making sure we spend time listening to a cross section of our people. Mm, sure. Uh, mm. As the church grows, we at least in my case, I was tempted to, as our church tripled in size, to back off of spending time with people. And I realized that uh, if I did that, and as I was doing that, I, I wasn't able to speak with the same level of profundity into the hearts of the people's lives. So. Uh, uh, so no matter how big your church gets, don't just spend time with the leaders. That's important. But spend time with a wide cross-section of people listening to their hurts and hopes. Yeah, very good. Um, also, again, you know, he talked about uh, monthly preparation, yearly preparation. I mean, how, how did that kind of look in your own ministry? Yeah, in terms of monthly preparation, uh, one of the things I would do uh, on Monday when I was recovering still from the Monday morning blues, is uh, instead of sort of tackling the immediate task uh, of the sermon coming, if if I was pretty exhausted, uh, I might just think of a sermon series I was doing a month or two out. Sure. Which which was less pressure for me and funner. Uh, But in terms of just sort of planning out, I would usually plan my sermons for a quarter. 
and uh, okay. every month I would sort of look at that quarterly plan. Mm. And uh, one of the things in the back of my mind was to make sure I'm giving my people a well-balanced diet of uh, doctrines, themes, topics. Uh, I was also including in my planning uh, the church calendar. You know, mm, yeah. we Christians don't just celebrate a day called Christmas. We celebrate a season called Advent. Sure. We don't just acknowledge a day called Easter. We celebrate a season called Lent. And mm. so uh, I wanted to be thinking seriously about those well in advance so that I could shape a six-week Lenten series and a four-week Advent series uh, that would gear us for these high holy days. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things that Heath and I talked about that we liked about this book is that you have this broke down into just a lot of segments, and even a chapter, most of these chapters are four, five, six pages, and then you have them broke down into... Um, you know, just paragraphs, a couple paragraphs. Uh, so what we did, there's no way we can cover all these. So Heath and I both kind of lifted out things that we um, really liked. One was, um, it, you know, the shed principle. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I, uh, I came across an article uh, in, in the New York Times 2010, August 2010, you can look it up, it's called, uh, the article is called Taking a Break from the Lord's Work, and it's basically a study on uh, clergy burnout, and uh, in the article it says that members of the clergy now suffer from obesity, hypertension, and depression at rates higher than most Americans, that yeah. their use of antidepressants has risen, Wow. And, uh, yeah. how mm -hmm. odd this is that, that a, that a, uh, a vocation once associated with rosy cheek longevity uh, now leads to so much burnout and depression. And uh, one of the reasons I left the pastorate to get in this teaching racket mm -hmm. is to is to invest in those who are investing in the local church because it is uh, I recognize now the hardest job in the world is pastoring, no doubt. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, the shed plan, you know, uh, preachers, pastors should be getting. Uh, better with time. Our best yeah. sermon should be ahead of us, before us, not behind us. And so one of the, one of the things I've noticed about preachers who get better with time, uh, not bitter or worse, uh, are preachers who build a shed. Uh, so, uh, S-H-E-D. Uh, they're people who develop healthy sleep patterns over time, at the S. Uh, during a busy stage with our church, Conviction, um, conviction. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I'm not. A, I'm not the type who needs a lot of sleep, but going going for weeks mm -hmm. on less than six hours a night of sleep uh, really caused my creative homolo homiletic juices to dry up. Honestly, mm -hmm. uh, so so during a busy time, our church was growing. My my family was growing. We had three kids in three years. I don't advise that. Uh, so lots of sleepless oh, nights yes. for me. So uh, I was burning the candle on both ends, mm. and, and uh, I, I remember being in meetings that I was leading, shaking my head like I knew what was going on and having wow. no idea what people were saying. Yeah. I was just, so, so I started to go to bed earlier, even if I just laid in bed and read a book. Uh, if I was in bed by 10 and woke up at 5 or 6, mm. uh, I just felt refreshed. Yeah. Uh, so sleep is so uh, much more important than I think we, we imagine it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and then hobbies. Uh, Having a hobby that allows us to forget the pressures and demands of ministry, I think, is, is helpful. Uh, some, some preachers, almost as a badge of honor, refuse to have hobbies. They're too spiritual for that. Um, uh, perhaps I'm less spiritual, but, but I need a hobby. Uh, so for me, one of the only things I could do that really allows me to uh, sort of forget the stresses and pressures of ministry is to... Stand in a moving body of water, casting a fly to rising <laughs> ground. So fly fishing for me is is, uh, is uh, so refreshing. Yeah. And then uh, and then uh, exercise. You know, uh, what's ironic is that uh, the less I exercise, the less energy I have for ministry. And the more I mm. exercise, the more energy I have for ministry. Yeah, That's right. Um, I remember during during. I was a part of a turnaround church, so uh, so you know, 
turnaround means change, which re means conflict, which means meetings. And so I was very busy, and the first thing to go out of my schedule was exercise. Sure, yeah. And I gained, uh, I gained 20 pounds that year, uh, coming home from board meetings, watching Schwarzenegger movies, eating pizza. Uh, <laughs> it didn't help me much. Were you a youth pastor? <laughs> no, it wasn't. I just, I just came home mad at certain board members and, and would watch shoot them up movies and eat a lot of pizza. Uh, yeah. Probably imagining that board member as I was watching. <laughs> so uh, exercise is so huge. And then, of course, uh, the D is for devotional life. Um, yeah. Most of us are like starving bakers. We're always baking goodies for other people yes. that we neglect giving ourselves. Yeah, you know, Mark, 3, Mark 3, 14 is so clear that uh, Jesus called the disciples to first be with him and then to preach. So, uh, yeah, Lenny, when, when I read this part of your book, I, it, was, it was a point of conviction because, I mean, the trap is always that I'm reading Scripture in the light of someone else or in the light of a sermon or mm -hmm. in the light of a Sunday school lesson. And, I mean, I'm, I'm just going to be gut-level honest. It is, it is so hard for me to discipline myself to read scripture from a devotional point of view. So like, you know, 2012, my goal was I want to get through the whole Bible this year, so I've got this plan. Mm. And it every day, every day, I have to pull myself in two or three times to say, this isn't for the person out there, this is for me. Yeah. One of the ways, uh, I'll take a backdoor approach, Tony, to what you were just saying. Uh, I actually think Preparing to preach to others should be devotional. Uh, mm. So, so, so I've been taught, like many of us, to separate the devotional reading from Scripture from our homiletic reading of Scripture, um, because it can deteriorate into what you're describing, Tony, where we just read the text, uh, looking for a sermon for other people. But I think if we actually go about the homiletic process first, allowing the text to lay its hands on us before we let it lay its hands on the congregation. Mm -hmm. I think then that we can do both. Sure. We can read Scripture devotionally and homiletically at the same time. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. it does. No, very good, yeah. very good. You, you talked about exercise. Uh, Dr. Keith Connor, who is uh, athletic director emeritus here at Southern Wesley University, did, her, did his doctoral dissertation on um, the health, the physical health, in the Wesleyan church. And this was, I don't know, 30, 40 years yeah, ago. Yeah. And he was astounded at how poor the health of ministers was in our denomination. And I'm sure it's only gotten as a, as a denomination that preached scriptural holiness for us to all be a bunch of gluttons <laughs> and overweight was yeah. quite a contradiction. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I, one of my, one of my mantras is we talk a lot about not drinking and not smoking, but uh, we don't talk often enough about gluttony and greed, uh, yeah. the two G's. You know, so uh, so I agree with you. We need to have a more holistic approach uh, as Wesleyan holiness preachers. Yeah. Um, but, there, uh, go ahead. There's a couple of questions from the uh, the chat room. Want to get in real quick? One was. Uh, does lamenting still have a place in preaching? And also, uh, some people want to know, who are some preachers that you either read or listen to regularly for inspiration? Yeah, I, I'd, 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 I'd want to know what they mean by lament. Uh, maybe be a little more specific in that question. I, I think uh, it goes back to when we were talking about prophetic preaching. Yeah. I think that's the direction that they were coming from. And in a lot of what the prophets did... They, there was just a lot of lamenting, like Jeremiah. I mean, <laughs> like, right, the weeping prophet. So uh, how does that, like, is there a place for that to, in today's context? Like, would it be, I yeah, think, no, what I the question is coming think, yeah. from? I think it's the heart of the question. Yeah. Uh, so should the preacher lament? I, I think, uh, I think the, the thing we should lament, I think it's, this really ties in with prophetic preaching, as, as I envision it anyway, is one of the challenges of prophetic preaching one of the calls is to hold up the difference between American churchianity and oh, biblical yes. Christianity. Oh. Yes, yes. And so uh, there should be a, a certain amount of lamenting uh, that goes on in that kind of preaching. So it shouldn't, so prophetic, pre I don't imagine prophetic preaching as a bold, always a bold in your face, you need to do this, you need to do that. 
I do think there's a place to with Amos stand up and say, let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Um, but I do think there's a place for lamenting the sins, not just of the world, but the sins of the church. Yes. And, and don't forget the prophets in the Old Testament, especially the minor prophets, uh, spoke mostly to the religious community, not to the community outside of the church. Uh, go ahead, and the second question was, um, are there preachers that you follow, um, preachers that you read after that inspire you? Yeah, I try, I try to force myself to listen to an eclectic mix of preachers. I think if I, you know, if I just listen to preachers who are my age, white, and think like me and act like me, that won't serve me all that well. So, uh, so I listen to men and women, mm. young and old, black and white, Very good. mainline, and evangelical. Uh, so some of my favorite preachers to listen to would be uh, sort of the mainline preachers like Barbara Brown Taylor, who puts words together better than anyone I, I can think of. Uh, Fred Craddock, uh, Eugene Lowry, author of The Homiletical Plot, Tom Long. So some mainliners uh, like that. Frederick Beekner, mm. who wrote one of my favorite books on preaching, Telling the Truth. And then I listen to the popular preachers like Andy Stanley, who's a great communicator, yeah. uh, people like Francis Chan, mm. uh, Nancy Orberg, uh, and then every and then African American preachers like Tony Evans, Cleophis mm. LaRue, uh, Teresa Fry Brown. So my goal is to listen to an eclectic group of preachers to learn from each of them how to better go about my homiletic process. Mm. Very good. Well, Lenny, thank you so much uh, for your insight today and for joining us. Tell tell listeners where they can find you online and where they can pick up uh, your book, Preaching Essentials. Yeah, Twitter, uh, Lenny Lucchetti. And uh, I also have a blog uh, where I write mostly about preaching. And that would be uh, LennyLucchetti.blogspot.com. Uh, you can Google search it on um, uh, Preaching Essentials is the, is the title of the blog. So I actually have uh, want to refer uh, your listeners to a sample preacher growth plan. Uh, one of the things I encourage preachers to do is to come up with an annual plan to grow. Mm. And so you can find one of those samples on my blog, just sort of a, uh, an annual growth plan for preachers, and uh, develop it according to your needs and interests. Well, Lenny, awesome. thanks so much for being with us this week. We know you have a busy schedule, and for you to take time out means a whole lot to us. Blessings on you. Thank you so much, guys. All right, bye-bye. Thank you, Lenny. Thanks, brother. Hey, we do have a copy of Preaching Essentials that we're going to be giving away. The giveaway uh, page is going to be up shortly at the Technology it Show. It is up. It, it is, is up. up. It's yes. ready. Uh, and you enter as often as you like. Enter a lot. Yeah, Tell let, your friends to enter. Let's say, as an example, you go to the website and you see like there's 70 entries, and you say, "Oh my word, 70 entries! Well, I have a one in 70 chance to win." That is not true, because there are many people who have put in multiple entries. There's different ways to do it by tweeting, by sharing on Facebook. Yes. Uh, if you need a, if you need a lesson in how to enter multiple times. Contact Seth Cotton. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he will walk yeah. you through. He will walk you through the proper methods for multiple yes. entries. <laughs> uh, yes. You know, one of the things I love about this interview with Lenny is uh, just the, the question out of the chat room: Who are you listening to? Who are the yeah. preachers that inspire you? Man, he gave us a list. And I had not heard of a lot of those people, so yeah. I might have to go back and listen to that. For and me, start yeah, I would say half of those I had not heard of. So, uh, wow. I mean, th and this is why this is why we do this show to get. Just just practical. His book, too, um, yep. just plug it one more time, very practical. And the way this is broke down, easily digestible, yep. um, four to six pages in a chapter. And then the way the chapters are broke down is are they're just paragraphs at a time. I mean, he's yeah. just got these points. Um, you, this book will not disappoint. I, I told Heath, if I was preaching homiletics in a Christian college... Yeah. Uh, teaching? Uh, well, preaching homiletics. I mean, excuse me, yeah. teaching. No, I meant to say yeah. teaching. Uh, I would use this as a text. Uh, it, it is a yeah. great book. Uh, you know, not only are we giving a copy of the book away, we all own a copy of the book. And, you know, like we said... Lenny mentioned a lot of great preachers that you could go and you could listen to them, listen to their message on iTunes. And while you're on iTunes, hey, you should hey, go. Yes, yes. You should go look up Do it. the Segway. Technology Show on iTunes. 
download the show. That helps us out in our ratings. Also, give us a rating. Please. Give please. us that would and give us a review. And and we need good that ones, boost please. <laughs> <laughs> good ones, please. <laughs> yes. It's not going to help us if it's on. My there. mom's already left ten. So <laughs> so anyway, um, and also if you've got a comment on today's interview, you can email that. To us at the Technology Show at gmail.com. Or if you've got your favorite preacher, email that to us as well. And please, uh, you don't have to include me on that list. <laughs> don't worry, they won't. It's time for. Download of the Week. Okay, so this week's Download of the Week, we're going to give you a warning. We have not tested this. Not in its current form. We, that's and right. And I don't know how I missed this. There was a while back. I don't know. For how. those of you who use uh, iOS devices, uh, you notice that without going to a carrier, it's really hard to tether your device. Uh, and, and tether meaning what? And tether meaning make... that tether you... Ball. Thank you. That's, good. that's a good question. Tether meaning that you're able to attach your device to... A computer and use the internet on your computer via the device. Yep. So uh, every once in a while, an application would sneak through the App Store. <laughs> yeah. One that did was called iTether, and it still is on here. Apple's great about this in that if they miss something and it made its way through, it still is available. Uh, so like I've I've restored this phone mm -hmm. and it still downloads off yeah. their server to to I think so. This iTether application that would let you use your USB cord. Plug it into your computer, and then you'd have internet if you were in a place where there wasn't Wi-Fi or something like that. You could use that. Well, once they realized, or once, I don't know the whole story. It was something about, well, they thought that the, that the was burden on carriers, burden on the carriers would be too much for that, so they pulled it from the App Store. Tether has created an HTML5 application that will work. So you download Works. this piece of software on your computer... It sets up what's called an ad hoc network uh, that you then attach your phone to. So it's not through a USB cord, but through uh, it's done over Wi-Fi. And then this HTML5 app lets you access that you don't have to be jailbroken. You don't have to have a tethering plan. Yeah. You can do this. I don't know how we missed this. This happened in like oh, March yeah. that they came out with this HTML5 thing. And one of the reasons that you'd stay a jailbroken on your phone was to tether. Exactly. But yes. that comes with a detriment. Like, I always feel like once I've jailbroken my phone, it just isn't, it, like, there's something not right. It's and it not feels as snappy. Like, no. like you shouldn't I, have done it. Not. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, Heath, if we want comments out of you, <laughs> we'll ask for them. Let Matthew talk. But you know what I mean. Like, when, when that happens, it just runs not quite as optimally as you wish it did. Well, this uh, little HTML5 app, you can go to tether.com slash web. You sign up for it. It is a $30 a year charge so it's a, a annually you know you'd have to buy a subscription to that uh 30 dollars a year but uh i think if you were doing this oh, over your carrier it. it's 30 dollars a month so <laughs> yeah. yeah and so here's what we've done in the show notes we've got two links one is to tether.com where you download the application to your computer the other is to a video that will walk you through this process right, it's right. a youtube video so just watch that, um, and, and creating your ad hoc network is not that hard. They walk you through that as well. So check that out if you have yeah, an iPhone. Very, very cool. Uh, how did I overlook this? I just don't know. I had no idea. Yeah. I was just as surprised as you were, Master TG. Yeah. All right, let's move on to They Said It. Read my lips. I'm going to say this again. I've never taken steroids or HGH. I took the initiative in creating the internet. The Macintosh, of all the machines I've ever seen, is the only one that meets that standard. Well, I'm not a crook. If you, if you know what you're doing here, slide, slide out. Slide out. We can't give out a Tylenol without a doctor's order. Why should we give out hormonal preparations with far more serious possible side effects, such as blood clots and hypertension? A school staffer in a New York City school who was concerned that young girls can get the morning after pill from the school counselor without their parents knowing. Source, the New York Post. Now, don't get me wrong. I see the value in using social media in many ways. 
What I'm proposing is how to set some boundaries to help you not let social media tools infiltrate your life to the point that you wake up in the middle of the night thinking of good things to tweet. Lauren Hunter, from her recent article, Three Social Media Boundary Suggestions, Source, Church Tech Today. Only one company could see its stock fall when it sells five million of its newest products in a single weekend. Apple. Robert Hoff reporting that Apple sold 5 million iPhone 5s, which is only half of what was projected to be sold. Source, Forbes. If churches and denominations require... (laughs) Well, if I could read. If churches and denominations require signing a code of ethics, they are bringing themselves in line with many professions, organizations, and industries. But, of course, signing a code does not ensure compliance. Ultimately, that is a matter of one's heart. Dennis P. Hollinger, president of Gordon Cronwell Theological Seminary, weighing in on the recent debate over whether pastors should sign a code of ethics. Source, Christianity Today. I think they should sing a code of ethics. I would do that. Sing a code of ethics. Sing, sing a code of ethics. Uh, so uh, in the pre-show, you were talking about, well, don't we do that in the Wesleyan Church? You know, don't we? Well, we don't sign a code of ethics. Right. Now, when you go to your ordination, right? There, I mean, you know, you take certain vows and, I, and things that you. You know, I had I had somebody ask me, you know, if uh, if there were certain things that I did now or you know did, and, and I and I just simply said, you know, I. I for me, I, I took a vow. I took a vow of ordination that there were certain things that I would not do. Yeah, lifestyle uh, right. issues. And, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so. Well, we covered yeah. originally when the story came out. You know, um, the evangelicals got together. I don't know if it was the national evangelicals, but anyway, um, a group of evan- evangelicals got together and they um, created this code of ethics. Right. And so. People that have signed this code, uh, Bill Heil, Heibels has done that, yep. Rick Warren has done it, uh, there are others. And so the link that we give you is, is a place that Christianity Today has set up where people are just weighing in on this issue. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, I, I, I like Hollinger's comment here that, yeah, you know, I mean, they do this in the professional world, but at the end of the day, yeah, it, I mean, this is a matter of one's heart. Yeah. I mean, it's you know. Well, even when you, now when you go when you go to Southern Wesleyan University, you sign a um, lifestyle statement. Yeah, yeah, I mean, when yeah. you go Very through good. the registration <laughs> line, that is part of your registration packet. What always surprised me is later in the semester, somebody would get in trouble for doing something. They're like, "Well, why can't I do that?" And they were like, "Well, you signed a lifestyle statement." I'm like, well, I didn't sign a lifestyle statement. And it was just something that they, they're coming through the line and they yeah. just wrote their name on. And they yeah. didn't, and re- so it'd be one thing to have a code of ethics. It's another thing to have a code of ethics that you educate people about and you talk about it and walk them through. And you know, I was thinking about this the other day. What if, what if the Wesleyan, what if part of ordination is uh, they checked your BMI, your body mass index, every year? <laughs> what? I'm just saying. No, I'm serious. I'm serious. If if I know as a pastor, well, you know, better not, better not smoke, better not drink, better not okay, run around my I, wife, better I not see. have yeah, pornography. And I know at, at the end of April, I'm going to have to fill out my report. What's your BMI? And I know your BMI better be, I'm going to tell you. I want to see a general conference arguing for this. I don't like to say. Well, it, it, it's, it's a legitimate question. It really is. And I, I remember the same thing at Southern Wesleyan. It would always shock me when people would be like, oh, why do we have to do these things? Well, you agreed to that. Come in. You knew that. I think that's why... Uh, like in the church, if we take this out of the, the pastoral aspect and really zoom in on the Wesleyan church, we call it covenant membership. And that word is used for a reason, that word covenant. It is a covenant. It's something, it, it's, it's a disagreement. And it goes back to this idea that, that just has continued to be on my mind recently that comes from Steve Deneff and Soul Shift, this whole mm-hmm. thing about submission. And he talks about what if, it's powerful. What if the, it is, it, his statement is, what if the crown jewel of being a part of a community isn't agreeing yeah. with everything that that community says? What if the crown jewel of being a part of a community is submitting yeah. to that community and, uh, and, and, and that there may be the need for that and we may need to desire that more highly? Yeah. It's a great thought. Now, okay, so let me, I'm just going to 
you know, play advocate here. Um, my my grandma Gardy, one of the great Christian figures in my life, had a huge impact on me. She went home to be with the Lord a couple years ago. I, I can hear Grandma Gardy responding to this to me, like, "Why should a preacher need to sign a code of ethics? They they ought to be ethical anyway. There mm-hmm. there should be no need for something like this." What? Yeah. My, my my grandma would say, why would a preacher yeah. need to sign a code of ethics? Um, by their very lifestyle, by their very calling, they would have already lined up with a code of ethics. Right. She would say it's a sad day if preachers have to start signing a code of ethics. They ought to be ethical anyway. Well, and I would tell you, it is a sad day. I mean, it is. That's true. Do you, I mean, you get my point. Yeah, yeah but, I totally. But I, but I, I agree with totally your grandmother. Get, I totally, I, I totally get Heath's point too, though. It is a sad day. We were talking. We but won't they, go into the details. But, but the, talking about people in ministry just before this show happened, yeah. who have experienced failings. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It is a sad I, day. Yeah. And well, again, I'm just. I mean, I, I'm for. I, I, I'm for it. I'm just saying. I can also hear this contrary voice out here. That's but saying. it's but also that contrary it, voice is nonsense in light of. The day and what we right. what we live like that mean that doesn't mean anything. Yeah, it does. It does. I, I get. I, I don't know. I get it, yeah. but I don't get it. It's something that's <laughs> like, well, why? So you're against. So you would really be against this? Like that would be something that you'd really be like, no, let's not. You will I sign. understand that as a general. You statement. will sign. Yeah, on the dotted line. No, I, I you will. Saying, you will sign. <laughs> All right. Everyone will sign, mm-hmm. and it, you will have it imprinted on your wrist. <laughs> You're bad. <laughs> um, our first story here, and they said it. This is one you sent me, I think, three weeks ago. We just finally yeah. worked it in. But um, this is frustrating to me at, at so many levels that literally, and this school staffer, they go unnamed in mm-hmm. the New York Post story, but the, the staffer is frustrated. You know, we cannot give a child a Tylenol. Right. Um, without permission from the parent, but now we can distribute the morning after pill without the parent knowing it. And in the article, if you go, another disturbing thing you're going to find is there are two or three teenagers, 14-year-olds, who are weighing in on this, mm. and their whole attitude is, absolutely, I should be able to do this. Absolutely, I would do that. We need this. And so um, so you're telling me that the 14-year-old knows more about how they need to be raised and what they need than their parents do. And yet, if that same 14 goes out and let's say they come to my home and they throw bricks and they destroy things, who's going to be held liable for that? The parents. The parents going to be held liable for it. Yeah. It is a uh, – uh, we, we talked about uh, abortion uh, a couple of weeks ago, I think, or we got off on, on that and uh, – it's just a sad, you know, it's just a sad, sad day. Uh, you know, at school, you a high schooler cannot have more than 850 calories with their lunch, but we can get you a morning after pill. <laughs> but part of, I mean, I, I don't want to be unsympathetic. Part, part of what statistics shows, if a girl gets pregnant as a teen, then life is, is from a financial point of view, is going to present huge challenges Mm -hmm. um and and maybe you know maybe part of what we need to do here is get the stick out and get after the church a little bit because the need for people to you know to step into other people's lives and and i'm i don't appreciate the pro um i I mean i appreciate the problem Mm -hmm. of teen pregnancy and how that throws young girls into poverty but i don't think this is the answer is there a more preventable epidemic in the United States than teenage pregnancy. Is there a more preventable epidemic? Don't have sex. Well, yeah, the kids. Uh, I mean, the way that we treat the kids is like they're animals. Like they have, they're just raging. and we, They are, they're raging hormones. But it's like they have no minds. Like they have no choice. Like they have no ability to reason and to think. And so we, it's like we treat them just like my dad is uh, we were t- in the pre-show. My dad breeds cows, and the way we treat kids today is the way he treats his cow. I mean, it's ridiculous. Yeah, we are more than hormonal. Yeah. Well, I'll get off my soapbox, so, but that's uh, my- I know, and I've, I've got a soapbox here too because I keep I'm going back now to this thing that we were talking about before this whole preacher thing and this concept of it's a sad day. Um, I'm just thinking again and again in my mind a conversation that I have with my mother often. She asked the question, is the world getting better or worse? And she's of the opinion that the world is getting worse. Mm -hmm. 
I don't think it is. I'm of the opinion that the world is just as sinful now as it was the day after Adam and Eve took the bite of the apple. And there were this the, this idea about, yeah, uh, 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 someone who's in pastoral leadership should just naturally be good. There were false sheep and, and, or, and false shepherds for the eternity of history. There yeah. have been, there have yeah. been this. So, I don't know. I'm just, it's well, just what's even when we talk mind. about our Christian heritage from Europe. Um, Rodney Starks and I, and um, I can't remember. There are two authors. Rodney Starks is one. The book is called "The Churching of America," mm-hmm. and his argument is: we talk about the glory days back in Europe when it was Christian Europe, and he said when you do the research, they they've done so. You know, they're sociologists. They contend that um, no more than five percent of Europe went to church. Five. Percent, right, yeah. um, and so uh, when you look at in the light of church history, I I have to I have to say I have a tendency to agree with you, Matthew. Well, that we, we say that it's worse today, but when you begin to study history, uh, you know Wesley in his day they fornicated on the street. I mean, a woman would be on the main street of London at night, and she might turn a trick on the street. I mean, I'm talking about intercourse on the street, yeah. so that she could. Turn the trick, get the money for her next high, which was gin, which was laced with cocaine. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I don't see a whole lot of that going on, you know. No, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it, it's, so. a, it's a nonsense argument. I wish I would have interjected that my, my brilliance is on delay. There's the court of the show. <laughs> Matthew's brilliance is you look on back delay. to the Old Testament. Moses goes up, goes up on the mountain. He's gone a little too long. People are like, Moses isn't coming back. Aaron. Doesn't uh, take long, does it? <laughs> Aaron, you need to build us an idol, and we're going to have an orgy while you do that, you know? And so. Uh, uh, well, real quick, let me get to this social media story because it was funny in the pre show. Uh, you know, she says, uh, you ought to have some boundaries so that in the middle of the night you're not getting up because you have a great tweet. And totally, you said. Totally guilty. About it. Yeah. So she's got three things here. Uh, these are her suggestions. I'm curious what you think about them. Number one, look at your calendar and select two days per week to ignore social media. Number two, ignore your mobile phone during family dinners, movie night with your wife, husband, out for a date, in deep conversation with family and friends, etc. Write fewer blog posts. What are you doing? Checking your phone. <laughs> so if you have a hard time tweeting in the middle of the night, uh, you know iOS 6 can help you out with this. Now, did you know Siri can tweet for you now? She can. She sure can. Let's, well, let, not on my phone. Yeah. Well, let's see here if we can make it happen. Siri, send a, a tweet saying, uh, we're in the middle of the technology show and Matthew's interrupting Tony. <laughs> She's thinking. Ta-da. <laughs> Here's your tweet. Ready to send it? All right. I'm going to send it just like she said, just like she wrote it. So there's right. many typos in there. There we go, guys. Okay. Done. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, so this is kind of what she's getting to about social media being out of hand. This is <laughs> <laughs> so wait a minute. So <laughs> you're talking about middle of the night. My wife's going to hear this strange voice. I'm going to get hit upside the head. <laughs> All right. All right, Dave. I'll, I'll send your tweet. I'll send your tweet. <laughs> to me, some of this stuff is, especially number two, ignore your mobile phone during family dinners, uh, movie nights, stuff like that. I, I totally agree with that. I mean, yeah, there should be a time like... I hate to. Uh, here's a moment of personal confession, but like with a, when Ashley and I have dinner, there are times when I when I have to say either to myself when she'll say it to me or to her, "Hey, let's put stuff down and actually just me and you." Right. Yeah. Yeah. We try to. A couple of things that I've been trying to do is set up my tweets either the night before or during the or in the morning so that I'm not having to tweet regularly. That's going out, but then also. We've kind of blocked, you know, three to six with our kids as far as homework. And I, I fail miserably at that <laughs> so many times. But that we're not on the computer, we're not on the iPad, that we're fully engaged. What, what do you think I, about her idea of two days a week, no social media? I don't think, I mean, this whole idea, I preached on Sabbath Sunday. Yeah. I don't think it'd be a bad idea. I mean, I, I don't know. Like two idea. days a week, I, I, I don't know. I guess it depends on the context of your family, sure. who, who you are. You're married. You got kids. Maybe that that is you're good. You're overboard with it, right? Right. Yeah. But but I do think <laughs> I, I let's let's back off from two. And what if we took it down to one? What yeah. if we were? What if we were? 
what if we had periods of time where we Sabbathed from that stuff to actually interact at a deeper level with our with our face family? to face? <laughs> I know. Well, what if? I mean, think about this. What if you know? I mean, John Wesley required his ministers to fast at least once a week, and I think it would be very uh, healthy to not just fast from from food and things, but fa- you know, fast from media and technology. I mean, that would be a wonderful. I mean, discipline, and it's going to be in my book. It gets awakening. Grace. It gets in this idea. Okay, so so this can become legalism very very quickly. And you're not saying that that this one thing is right for everybody. Not absolutely. Not right. not at all. But I would say, let the spirit of God talk to your heart about this. Say you know, and maybe to do that to help the spirit do that. Keep a log of the amount of time that you spend on this stuff. Like I was, I got to a point. It's been a couple years ago now where I was spending way too much time on Facebook. Basically, I just, I am, even though it may look like I'm there, I'm not there. Like the things that go there are things that I'm putting in other places where there's not actually no interaction at all and it just ends up there. And I don't go and hmm. read what people write about. Like yeah. it's just because I can't, I can't spend the, the detailed, intense amount of time in there. Paul, uh, Paul Tillman's got a great comment in the chat room. He said, when you go out to eat with your friends, everybody puts their phone in the middle of the table, and anybody who grabs their phone during dinner has to pay the bill. There you go. That's a great idea. That's a wonderful idea. We're going to lunch after. Drake? Yeah. (laughs) Drake, you're paying for All right. Well, we're not... (laughs) Drake. (laughs) His son. His son. (laughs) I don't care, boy. Wash dishes. Um, we won't take a lot of time. Well, it won't take any time to talk about it. But uh, it, curious to me, or interesting to me, Apple sells five million uh, yeah. iPhones, iPhone five, and the the stock drops a little bit. Yeah, best best of the initial weekend it's sales so far. The reason it dropped is analysts said, oh, they could sell ten million of these things. Oh my word! Five million phones. I mean, just think about that. And Forget the analysts. Like, yeah, exactly. Forget the analysts. Five million phones. Five million. I mean, what, what you have to look at. People say is is Apple stock um, overvalued? It's not because you have to look at the value of the company. Right. There's this mathematical wow. thing uh, that that they were referencing on something I was listening to the other day, talking about its actual value based on. The things that how it's performing in the real right. world and like of of just about any stock, it has this the the ratio number for it is tremendous. Like it is a, it's not a risky investment. It, it, it is. It is a serious conversation about will Apple stock get to a thousand dollars a share? And because right now, because of their revenue, they're not an overvalued company. Five million of these things, and they're worldwide. I mean, this is the thing I think that yeah. those of us in the United States are missing, that this phone was released to, what, 30 countries? This is the yeah. first one that, that at, the, at the same time, without like a week or a month delay, uh, and it's delayed in some places. It didn't come yeah. out everywhere at the same time, but it had a much bigger release. And, and if you buy a, a, an iPhone 5 on the Verizon network... It's unlocked. It's you carrier can unlocked. It. Yep, you can use it for with AT and T. I am due for an upgrade. Uh, hold on now, November the second, and on, uh, no, no. debating not, whether or not I'm going to upgrade. So I'm we not may... entirely sure that that AT and T thing is correct. At least I know that the LTE portion, the frequency is different. My sources so it tell work me on that it might 3G and otherwise. Your sources. But... All right, let's wrap this up and talk about next week. Really excited about our yes. guests next week. Um, Rachel Held Evans will join us via Skype, going to talk about her book, A Year of Biblical Womanhood. If you have gone to her blog before, um, you have found some very uh, interesting reading and... and um, it's Things gonna, that spur some great discussion, too, really? don't they? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And she and, and, and um, some will look at her as controversial to me. I think that she raises some legitimate questions oh, yeah. that we have to ask, and especially in the context of the Wesleyan Church, where we um, have uh, historically ordained women in the ministry. Um, so really excited about that. And they just, on her blog, just reached 1,000 posts. So that's a pretty big milestone. So All kudos. Right. Um, real quick, just for the whole month of October. So we have Rachel next week. Uh, we have uh, Claire Diaz-Ortiz. Um, we're going to talk about her book, Twitter for Good. She works for Twitter. She's a believer. And if you are trying to maximize your Twitter 
to, to use it for um, raising funds for nonprofits or just to get word out about your church, this is going to be the podcast for you to listen to because uh, – and her book, Twitter for Good, is all about that. Yeah. The October 16th, I know Matthew's really looking forward to this. Dan and Joy Irvin will be in studio. In studio. Wonderful people. I love those guys. Yeah. yeah. They are just such good people. In the Wesleyan Church, they are the area directors for the Carib Atlantic and just servants of God. October 23rd, Dr. Timothy Tennant, president of Asbury Theological Seminary, will be with us. And then October 30th. Dr. James Emery White will he be with us to discuss his book, What They Didn't Teach You in Seminary. Great book, mm-hmm. too. Yeah. All right, Heath, where can our listeners find you on the intranet? They can go to heathmullican.com and there follow me on Twitter and find me on Facebook and YouTube, all those great places. All right, Teach. Yeah, you can find me. Where can you find me? Not on Facebook. I mean, I may look like I'm there, <laughs> but I'm not. Uh, MatthewTG.com, everywhere you want to be. All right, you can find me at Facebook forward slash AKC64. And if you want to do further research on anything we discussed today, you can find all the links to the stories we covered at our website, thetechnologyshow.com. If you want to contact us, send your emails to thetechnologyshow at gmail.com or leave us a voicemail by calling us at 3049-TEOLOGY. That's 304 304- 986-5649. Leave a message. We may even play your comments on here. Matthew's over there playing. Uh, we also want to encourage you to use our email and voicemail. If you have questions for Rachel Held Evans um, and you'd like to, I mean, questions you want us to ask her, you can get those in ahead of time by using our email or our voicemail. We just really welcome that. And as always, we want to thank you for joining us. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Adios.